was very very early members of the DML community. And so when he offered that it, he would like to come and share his experiences with us, I thought it's very delightful. And the director was also very happy. And uh, so that's how he's here. We started uh, making some communication and I think fortunately he is here only this week and we are able to get him here. So he will assist Mr. Andy George to do his presentation. And I think so, so I'll let them tell the story. Can we just introduce ourselves? Yes, uh, that would be wonderful. Maybe he will Yeah. So I am TK Nandi, I am uh, heading the water vintage activities in the uh, two groups, water vintage group and water processing group. So, okay. I am Akbar out. I think that uh, Matt Iso stack pressing group. You already? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I am Ashutosh. Uh, Ashutosh. Ashutosh. Ashutosh, working in uh, the powder vintage group by the Sanjay But I won't be speaking only on powder vintage No, no, you please speak on it. <laughs> Sir, I'm Ravi Kiran, working in board matters. I am Sridhu, working in border processing. I am D.H. Sao, working in border processing. I am Vikipal Shura, working in border processing. Sir, I am Charit Chandra, I am from the Steel School. Pardon? Steel School. He works with me. So, I am Bala Kuli Krishnan, so I head this special Steel School now. And with you? Yeah. You are working on? Special steels. Basically, we are working on steels for the naval applications. High strength low alloy steels. Okay. So, uh, can you go ahead and talk? The only reason I am here is because my father said that he may not remember things accurately. So, I prepared a short presentation. And uh, the whole objective is to get you thinking so that you can ask. Even though he says, don't ask me questions, you, this purpose is to ask questions and uh, to talk to him about the early history. We can ask and he can say, I don't remember. Because there's a chance that you may remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a chance the questions might trigger some new memory. Of course. <laughs> Mr. Aparam. You work in India abroad? I am abroad. I, I work abroad, but I was trained as a metallurgist thanks to my father. Which uh, country? Uh, I got my degree from IIT Madras. Yeah. And then I got my uh, master's and PhD from University of California in Berkeley. So after that, so I you you got in the US. I'm sorry. You are in, in the US. I'm in the US. I come visit my father once a year, and I thought we were talking about this, and I've known that I've always felt sad that he has not gone back to DMR uh, because I think he has a lot to offer, uh, and especially uh, as you said, uh, Sunandi, you know, if you if you learn about the history. Uh, and also some of the things that he did, which is, uh, he was very innovative, and you will see yeah. some examples. Uh, so I'm hoping that will inspire you, and, um, uh, you know, in, in uh, I think all large organizations now are realizing that they are losing what is called institutional knowledge. So as long as, as uh, when the senior uh, staff retire and leave, that they take that knowledge away with them. And it does not get passed to the younger generation. So sometimes it's okay, but sometimes you repeat mistakes that they've already tried out and so on. So at least you can learn what not to do and try new things. And so I'm hoping that uh, through some of these stories and so on. Yes, sir. Yeah, please. All administrative things I have done, I don't think uh, I have heard the percentage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So many things. Uh, I, I think you could have also discussed with him a lot. So, yes. you know, anytime he says he does not know the answer, and he's, 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 he's to completely free to interrupt me anytime. And as are you. So, this is an interactive thing. Don't uh, don't wait till the end. Uh, you can stop me at any time if you. By the way, he's Dr. Nagesh. He's involved in extraction of Tesla. Hi. I, I'm, I'm talk this is my father, Mr. N.T. So, he was, he's, his project started with tungsten. He brought tungsten to. To uh, uh, so um, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, express, especially express my deep thanks to Dr. Balamuli Krishnan and the uh, DML director, Dr. Vikas Kumar, who isn't here, but uh, for making this visit possible. This is a, a huge, huge thing for my father because to come back to his site where he spent a lot, many, many decades, and uh, put a lot of uh, energy into it. And so I, I think I mentioned that uh, there are two reasons why I'm giving this presentation instead of my father. My father is very worried that his fading memory is 92 years old now. Uh, that will, he will need you to give you wrong information. 
and therefore I'm hoping that my talking will help jog some memories and he will tell the best reaction I can get is that he gets angry and says, you idiot, that's not how it happens. So if that, <laughs> if that happens, then, then I know that I have at least succeeded in my mission. Also, um, uh, I, I have a personal reason for doing this. Uh, I have been to many funerals and I have never been a fan of uh, people who pay great tributes to the man who's dead. You know, so, because uh, my opinion is that this is a completely useless exercise because the intended audience is nowhere to be found. You know? so, so might as well do this when they are alive. And so I, I owe a deep debt to my father personally because of all the stories that he told me that inspired me to become a metallurgist myself. And so this gives me, thanks to Bala and the director, it gives me a public opportunity to thank my father publicly for all his inspiring stories that helped me become a metallurgist myself. So a little bit on the talk. The talk will have three parts. Uh, the first is a little bit on the early history of Yamaha. Uh, and then some examples. The second part will be some examples of my father's technical accomplishments. And finally, even though he was never trained as a manager, uh, he passed on some very important management lessons to, you, to me, uh, which I have used in organizations in the US. But I'm hoping it will be useful here also, because uh, those of you who are managers, uh, we, you will find some very interesting tricks that he, he got. Now, I put two references here. And the first reference by Ramdas Shenoy covers the period that my father was at, at DMR, from 1958 to 1982, basically the formation of DRDO. Uh, to the establishment of Diamano. My father retired in 1980, so it's been almost uh, 37 years since he has been at Diamano. Um, but interestingly enough, Shenoy makes no mention of my father in the in the book, in his book. But uh, Gopal Upadhyaya uh, mentions my father in this Men of Metals and Materials. It's a memoir, and he's very respectful of what my my father did at. Uh, at uh, uh, DMR. Now, Upadhyaya says um, that my father was a can-do kind of practical guy. So the first part. So that book is still available. Somewhere? Yeah, yeah. You can get it on the web. You can uh, uh, Google these, and you will get both of them. Okay. Shanoj's book is freely available. You can get a PDF of that. Uh, I think Upadhyaya, you may have to purchase, okay. but otherwise. But still, it's available. It's available. Okay. But his father was also a professor in Toronto. Okay. What are the Right. right. So, uh, so the first part is the early DML history. So I'll start by embarrassing my father. Uh, so my fa I joke that my father had uh, two loves. My mother was very clearly his first love, and she was from Hyderabad. And so the, uh, at that time, my father was in Delhi working in a section called RT14, which was uh, uh, basically transferring uh, DMRO from what was then known as the Technical Development Establishment. So DRDO was formed in 1957 uh, by uh, Krishna Menon, who was the Defense Minister at that time. Okay? And basically, uh, DMRO was formed, uh, they, they consolidated a bunch of TDEs, or uh, Technical Development Establishments, and DMRO was TDE Metals. And it was originally also called the Inspectorate of Metals and Steel and located in uh, Ishapur near Calcutta. So the move, decision to move to Hyderabad was made in the early 60s. And my father was transferred to Delhi in headquarters and that's where he worked on the, the transfer part of it. And we were also very lucky because the Chief Minister, Ramana Dharati, was very far-sighted far at that time. He, he saw the potential for locating all the defense labs in this area. And so he allocated a lot of land uh, and so on. And the first uh, office of DMR was in uh, Ahmed Mohammed Mandir, that belonged to a Nawab, right? He only got it. Right. And so Brahmananda Reddy was, was instrumental in getting this site. And then, of course, DMR actually was located on another site near PM Plant, was it? I mean, the original site. DMR should have come on the Council site. Uh, so, ah. so, but, uh, I'll tell you that. Yeah. So, so this this site that where the MR was was picked by my father. So, uh, again, another embarrassing thing for my father. If uh, my mother and the MR were his two loves, his mistress was definitely tennis, because he almost did not become a metallurgist because he was crazy about tennis. 
He was the tennis champion at IISC Bangalore. And uh, unfortunately, in those days, in this we are talking 1947-48, tennis professionals had to pay for matches. They did not get paid. And so uh, that, that made him decide that maybe metallurgy was a better option in, in terms of uh, uh, taking up a career. Uh, but I think the, uh, tennis did him good. The reason why he is alive and healthy at 92, I feel, is because of all that time that he spent playing tennis. He used to spend four hours a day, every day, uh, playing tennis. Uh, from a scientific point of view, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Professor Richard Feynman. He is a quantum physicist. Uh, he was part of the atomic bomb program. And Feynman and fa my father share some very interesting qualities. Um, because Feynman, Feynman is famous for saying, study hard what interests you most in the most undisciplined, irreverent, and original manner as possible. Okay? So the thing he shared with Feynman was that my father was irreverent. And he got into trouble a lot uh, while he was uh, a scientist at BMR, especially from his bosses. And his bosses included Tamankar and uh, Arnachalam and so on. Uh, so, so, but, but this also led to some very, very interesting discoveries, as you, you will see. He did not believe everything that was uh, written in textbooks and had to see it for himself. So sometimes he would go back and check it. In fact, he taught me not to trust everything that is read, written in textbooks. Because every time, every time you see something in print, you think that is true. Uh, Feynman also, in a similar way, reinvented quantum mechanics to create this whole field of uh, quantum electrodynamics. Now, the, the, the advantage my father has is that he has a very strong foundation in the fundamentals. He started out in chemistry. He had, he had a, a MSc chemistry before he went to IASC and did metallurgy. Uh, and so basically those fundamentals were very strong and he was able to apply it in very unique ways. So the combination of irreverence and strong fundamentals gave him a mischievous sense of humor. You know, So he would pull the legs of all the scientists around here when he was, when he was a director uh, by, by testing them to find out how strong they were in their own understanding. And unlike Feynman, he actually was quite disciplined. I mean, he took tremendous notes. He was sent abroad to start the PM plant project. And because of his detailed notes and how he's put together the how the projects were being conducted, this was in the UK, he was able to transfer the program uh, project very seamlessly to PM plant. So the early start of PM plant was uh, in uh, tungsten uh, uh, carbide. And that's what he was sent to. Uh, England for. Um, basically, he learned the PM pro process for manufacturing the projectiles. And then he realized that we were still uh, importing tungsten powder in India. So, so there was no manufacturing process for producing tungsten powder from tungsten ore. And here, the British company that was <coughs> helping uh, my, train my father in making tungsten carbide, they also made some projectiles to uh, 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 demonstrate that they can, uh, they can do this. Uh, they helped him get connections to companies that were able to extract the uh, tungsten from the tungsten ore. So both processes, the, the powder metallurgy for tungsten as well as the extraction from tungsten ore were transferred to PM plant by my father. And uh, in this case, when I was a young kid, I used to tease my father that he had the ultimate job security. You know? <laughs> because half the time he was working on projectiles, armor piercing projectiles. And the other half of the time, he was developing armor that would withstand these projectiles. You know? So <laughs> this job would go on forever. <laughs> so um, some of, now I'll switch to the second part, which is the interesting project that he uh, undertook. Or perhaps the most famous project that he undertook was the MiG aircraft uh, brake pad project uh, in the 70s. So in the 70s, the Indian Air Force informed the Prime Minister that their, the MiG aircraft would be grounded because the supply of these brake pads from Russia was interrupted. With the Russian, there was a lot of finger pointing going on. The Russians uh, said that these, uh, the Indians did not know how to use the, the, uh, the brake pads and so on. So the challenge came to my, uh, DM Adil and my father here to develop the, come up with the innovative indigenous process for manufacturing it because the supply had stopped. Otherwise our entire flight, uh, fleet of uh, mix would have been grounded. So what were the challenges? There were both technology and technology transfer challenges um, and equipment challenges. 
India did not have very large dynamometers for testing these aircraft brakes <coughs> under this very severe rejected takeoff condition. So that is the most severe condition to test uh, brake pads. And if, as you probably all know, brake pads are an interesting concoction of multiple things. But uh, some of the key ingredients are the low temperature lubricant, which is graphite, high temperature lubricant, the Russians use molybdenum oxide. Right? And then you have a steel backing plate on which the sintered brake pads are uh, put. So we did not have, again, high, uh, large, heavy equipment, high temperature uh, uh, compaction and sintering equipment for making this concoction onto a uh, steel backing plate. So, so there were a number of innovations that my father came up with. The first thing he did was to electroplate this iron first in order to replace all of the surface impurities because otherwise the, the sintered mass would not bond to the, to the, break, uh, the plate. And it was a two-step sintering process. So he did loose pack sintering first, followed by fully compacted sintering of the brake pad onto this electroplated backing plate. And uh, unlike the Russians, he used a molybdenum instead of molybdenum oxide. And the reason because molybdenum has, a, has the benefit of providing high temperature strength to the brake pad, but, but during the braking action, it gets converted to oxide, so it does act as a lubricant also. So it, it this did uh, uh, provide the end result, uh, uh, which was needed with the molybdenum uh, uh, oxide. And the only way you could test rejected takeoff was on an actual MiG aircraft. And so this is where he got a really great respect for test pilots, because these test pilots are some of the bravest people he has ever come across, and, uh, and some of the boldest people. Uh, I think in this case, the test pilot joked that, sir, as long as you give me a few beers, I'm, I will do anything you want. <laughs> so they actually tested this on a MiG aircraft. Um, uh, by 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 landing it, and my father was uh, sweating bullets when this thing landed to make sure that uh, it would uh, uh, it would break, and uh, it did. And you know the rest is history, as they say. Production yield was much higher than the Russian process, and uh, India started expo exporting brake pads to to Russia. Oh, okay. There's a chat for a few We can wait. I mean, if he's interested in this part, technical part. Director says he'll be able to join. We just got you. Let us continue. Oh, let us continue. Okay. okay. It's mainly the scientists who are the audience. Yeah. So, so uh, we visit some of them. Yeah. Okay. Maybe the initial history part we can go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the second technical problem was uh, how do you attach? The, uh, on, the, on the other mating surface was cast iron. Uh, um, attaching the cast iron to the steel, to steel again was a huge problem. Okay, the, uh, the reason cast iron is very uh, advantageous is because cast iron has a high graphite content and therefore high heat capacity. So it can absorb a lot of heat as opposed to, say, mild steel. And so it allows the friction to increase in a smooth way. But back, back uh, Welding the cast iron to steel is not an easy job, right? Um, and so previous attempts, uh, one of the problems which happened, and I'll mention this mildly, is that because of his uh, uh, interactions with the director, the director's director used to usually pick another scientist to try the project out. And when they couldn't succeed, they would come to my father. Right? So they, this previous uh, scientist tried to pour liquid cast iron uh, in the gap between the cast iron and the mild steel and it did not attach, right? So my father came up with the solution of covering the steel plate and the, and the gap between the plates, about a centimeter or so, with borax. And then pouring the molten cast iron vertically in the gap between the cast iron and the mild steel. And so when the borax slag floats up, it just creates a uh, perfect joint, right? So it just takes up. Right, so all the uh, oxide and so on. So some of the projects I'm going to talk about, I'm, I'm mostly picked based, based on story value rather than, than any chronological order or, or uh, technical content. So please bear with me. Uh, they're more for having some fun. 
Okay, so another interesting project was uh, magnetic compass needles. And this is, uh, I don't know, 60s and 65 volt. No, I don't want you, that's why I want so, no, 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 you're fine. Uh, thanks for, uh, first of all, we are very thankful for bringing him. And we are really honored to have him. So, now probably young people are there. Exactly. 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 No, I was, I was telling Bala that that was the main interest. So, I was more than happy when I got this thing and I thought somehow I should call him. And his guidance and I think more than that, lessons are required now. <laughs> I can only give blessings. Not blessings with the heart will come to 100%. Not <laughs> now completely everything is there, so many areas are there. Because my technical knowledge is now fading away. <laughs> okay, so, so I was basically, uh, so we covered a little bit about the early history of Yamaha. Now I was going through some projects that he did and some of his contributions. We covered the brake pad project where he uh, did the uh, and the, and the uh, 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 made it more reliable in terms of getting uh, the bonding to the steel plate. Now, I was going through a whole list of interesting projects, mainly for story value, because it would be interesting to see how he solved some of these problems. So, uh, in the 65 what is it? When, when was the, when did France stop? Uh, this, uh, with yeah. So France stopped supplying magnetic compass needles to the Indian Army, and the demand was in thousands. Now this compass needle has a very interesting combina uh, combination. It's a high carbon steel, 1%, with uh, also very high alloys. Uh, and so basically, uh, what they do is they roll this in the austenitic condition. So when they, when it's in an austenitic condition, the steel is very soft and can have, even though it has 1% carbon it can be rolled into very thin foil. We did not have the equipment in terms of precise high temperature rolling mills and punching equipment to make two tau thick. The two tau, I don't know if people still use no, thousands, of, uh, thousands, yeah, of yeah, thousands of an inch, which is uh, 50 microns, right? Uh, uh, thick with center holes. So initially, Dr. Kamankar assigned another BML scientist to carry out the project. So what they did was they cast the alloy into rods, they tried forging it, and they ended up with powder. And that's when they came to, to my father. And so the, my father's uh, uh, solution was kind of innovative. He said, don't put the carbon in, just take the iron cobalt chromium alloy, and that, uh, that you can roll because it is very soft, and you can make it into an alloy foil uh, down to uh, two, 2 thous. Then you carburize it. And the carburization thickness is about one mil. Uh, it limits itself at one mil. So instantly you get a the one percent carbon uh, uh, composition that you wanted, but you've also managed to make thin foils and being able to punch the punch the needles. Why do you need the carbon in the first place? Just make it Why do you need the carbon? Carbon. Why? To make it in your steel. But why one Without percent? carbon, there is no steel. I know, but why one percent? One percent uh, that gives uh, the amount of cement that much more. Ah. It has to be hard and it's stiffer after it has to be right. 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 You don't ask questions to me. <laughs> 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 I can say. Exactly. Exactly. But I'll say. I would say. I'll, 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 I'll surprise you. Gave rightly cement type. So I was not expected. <laughs> 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 Okay, so, so the next story I have is the case for Midani. And this was a very interesting story because my father found himself on both sides of the, of the issue. Uh, and in both cases, he was unfortunately forced to oppose uh, the then director, which was uh, Kamanga. Um, uh, you know, the, I think he learned the uh, meaning of the English phrase, which says, uh, be careful what you wish for. Okay? Uh, uh, and you found this out uh, both in terms of uh, when Vidani was formed. So initially, uh, he planted this idea in Tamankar's mind 
that India really needed a factory to manufacture super alloys, tungsten wires, margin steels, and titanium alloys for India's defense and space needs. Now, Dr. Tamankar was originally opposed to this idea. He said, Diyamalu's responsibility is to do research and transfer it to industry. We have no business running a factory in, these, uh, in, this, uh, in this area. So my father's counter argument was that DML, of course, DML has no experience in industrial transfer of technology at that time. Uh, and so, but it has the expertise necessary to pick the right kinds of manufacturing equipment. So we know what we want. It's just that we we don't we have never had the experience to build a factory. So we should we should go ahead and procure that equipment from abroad and start the factory. That was the original uh, argument with the market. And slowly, slowly. Tamankar became convinced of the importance of Midan, right? And when he did become convinced, then he did a fantastic sales job. He went around convincing politicians and other decision makers that without Midani, India would go to the dogs, right? And so, so then it became like a, 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 the, this, this project had momentum. But the funny thing that happened was that when Dr. Tamankar became the first chairman of Midani, he wanted to convert DMRL into a support laboratory for Vidhan. And again, my father found himself opposing the mantra because uh, he said DMRL has a much broader mission uh, than as a, as a premier uh, laboratory, metallurgical research laboratory for defense, and therefore it should not be limited to just being a support laboratory for, for Vidhan. So in both cases, he got into trouble with uh, Dr. Kumar. Well, the fact the fact that DMR well, exists yeah, now is because yeah, of the uh, uh, fight. Yeah. Good story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. So this is a lot of history. Here he opposed, then he became CMD of the Binani chairman. Yeah. And he wanted to be to be. So my father was always a troublemaker, and so uh, he always uh, got into trouble with the directors. <laughs> Um, uh, another project was uh, for uh, DC motor brushes. I'm sorry to jump around between different projects, but um, this this is an interesting project. Uh, this is for aircraft DC motors, and the idea uh, here is that these brushes. I'm sorry, the picture is not very clear, but the brushes that touch the commutator uh, are made of graphite copper. So they end up rubbing against each other. The graphite is the one that is. Uh, keeps the wear very low, right? And, then, and there's a trick to it, which is that the copper forms an oxide uh, at uh, sea level because there is moisture in the air and so on. The cuprous oxide absorbs graphite and ensures that the dynamic friction between the graphite surfaces is, is low, and therefore there is low wear. But once you put this in air aircraft and you're flying at high altitude, both the oxygen and the humidity are low, and therefore the cuprous oxide is an unstable oxide. It decomposes, and you start getting metal copper copper friction, which is very high, and the, bed, the brushes end up wearing out much faster. Now, the Russians had discovered a very interesting solution. What they did was they incorporated lead and tin into the copper graphite. And there is also another interesting trick, which is that the lead and tin should be separate, it should not be alloyed. Because if it is alloyed, then it will not absorb copper. But during the operation of the frictional friction operation, it forms an alloy where the, the graphite gets absorbed instantly into that lead-tin alloy, and that's where it starts the friction. So, so uh, that, that way you can uh, make it last for long. Now, technically, this is a huge challenge, because uh, if you think about it, copper and graphite is typically centered at 800 degrees Celsius. <coughs> But the tin melting point is 232 degrees Celsius. Uh, lead melting point is 327. So putting all these dissimilar materials together and preventing the lead tin from forming an alloy is a very difficult task. Uh, and again, uh, same story. Uh, another scientist took this up. And despite of this best efforts, he could not keep the lead and tin unalloyed during the sintering process. So, but my father solved the problem and uh, now it was time to have some fun. So I'll, I'll tell you this as a story. So uh, when he solved the problem, the scientist became very curious and he said, uh, how did you solve the problem? And so my father, usual mischievous self, he, he pulled his leg and he said, 
uh, what is the mechanism that governs a loin? So the scientist sir answered correctly. He said uh, diffusion, sir. Uh, so my father said, uh, what controls diffusion? And the scientist said correctly again, temperature and time. You know? And so uh, my father then couldn't help it. He said, well, if you had known all this, you could have solved the problem. <laughs> and so um, the trick was, trick was to provide uh, the temperature, but very little time. So, so the, the that way you only assure surface diffusion, but not bulk diffusion. And so, what he the the solution that my father came up with was to use this entire mixture and do hot pressing. So you do uh, hot pressing for a few minutes to compact and center it so that you get the surface bonding between the particles but it's the bulk is bulk remains uh, intact and you can also put all the connecting wires for the brushes in this uh, 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 during the hot pressing operation so that that was an interesting little trick so there was no alloy there was no alloy but, but only the surface got on surface um so my own brush patterns a bun with uh, copper carbon composites. So during my undergraduate years at IIT Madras, I worked uh, at one summer at the PM plant. And here my father had a crazy idea of uh, making uh, copper carbon composites by sintering copper acetylide precipitates. Now, the way this works is you take acetylene gas and you bubble it through copper sulfate solution and it produces this red precipitate called copper acetylite. Um, there is a problem. The copper acetylite has these, what, um, uh, it's called uh, water of crystallization. The molecules of water attached to each molecule of the copper carbon. So normally, if you um, don't dry it, if it's under moist conditions, it's very stable. But if it, is un if it dries, if there is a drying or if you're trying to sinter it, you reform acetylene from this compound. And so that acetylene will catch fire and explode. So uh, thankfully, when we were compacting it and pressing it, nothing happened. You know? And then we went in, uh, we put this into a tube furnace and went to have a chai. Right? And then this, we heard this huge explosion. Thankfully, nobody was around the furnace because everybody used that tea break. Uh, this is this is an exaggeration. I just put I just got one picture of an explosion from the internet. Um, but thankfully nobody was injured, um, and I was very fortunate that I did not get personally cru crucified because uh, I was the boss's son. <laughs> um, the another project was on producing high conductivity pure tin foil, and this requirement came from Bharat Dynamics for a high conductivity tin foil for missile components. Again. Uh, France had stopped the supply, so we had to come up with an indigenous process. And so the scientists at uh, BD, uh, you know, good BD. metallurgists, but BD, BD, I'm sorry, BD, BD uh, good metallurgists uh, did did the conventional thing, which is to get pure tin particles, melt it in a crucible, use a flux, and then roll it in a foil mill, and so on. But the problem was that the resistance of this foil was very high. So after struggling for a month. Uh, with trying to get a workable process, he came to my father, and my father said he would show him how to make this in one hour. <coughs> and again, uh, uh, the BDO scientist was shocked. He said, sir, I've been trying very hard for over a month. How could you possibly do it in one hour? So uh, my father told him to bring a Pyrex glass tube, put all the tin pellets into it, seal it at one end, I mean, evacuate the tube and seal it, then show it to a flame and melt it. So that uh, uh, and when and when it solidifies, any tin, tin melting is 230 degrees. Yeah. So when it solidifies, any <coughs> cavities that are there, you can basically uh, roll it without much difficulty. Then uh, break the glass tube, roll the pellet in a foil rolling mill, and measure the electrical conductivity. It became very easy to roll, and why, because there was no solid contamination, the conductivity was better than the imported stuff. So uh, I'll like to ex uh, uh, end the examples with uh, with armor because uh, since I started with projectiles, it's only fitting that we should talk about armor. So um, and this when I was a little boy, uh, I used to uh, watch. My father had the job of washing the dishes in the house, 
my mother used to make him wash all the dishes. And one day, while I was wa watching him wash the dishes, he was staring very fascinatedly at a spoon that he held in the, in the water. And basically what happens is there is something called the Conda effect, which is why airplanes fly. Uh, which is that when you have a fluid that is flowing past the surface, it will follow the surface shape of the it surface. Follow, follow. Like, right. due to gravity. And of course in airplanes you use the forces to get you the lift for the plane uh, by, by making sure that you have a vacuum underneath the wing and so on. But in this case what he was trying to do was to break up the, the, <coughs> the initial stream into multiple streams. So imagine having another curved surface below and so on. So this one single stream can be broken up into multiple little streams and you basically dissipate this hot copper jet that would be sent by a heat projectile uh, by using hollow aluminum spheres. And this is found both in the British Chabam armor and this is what he had proposed for Kanchan armor. I have no idea what, with what, whether that still exists right now, but that was the original uh, uh, premise. Also, he was very fascinated with composites, uh, especially with uh, fish scales wood and bones, uh, because he was fascinated how nature is able to take brittle materials and make them strong in, in a number of very clever ways. Um, fish scales, of course, uh, this has been used in armor uh, from several thousand years ago. This is being mentioned in Chinese poetry as armor for a horse. Um, wood, of course, you, you know, it's a fiber-based uh, composite, so I will not talk too much about it. You guys know all this. And uh, bone is very interesting because you take completely brittle materials like calcium phosphate and calcium carbonate and through this interesting uh, porous structure coupled with uh, uh, tissue, you can make an extremely strong and uh, tough material. So this was, this was something that he was using. I don't know how exactly he used it, but uh, he was playing around with these. Um, so finally, uh, the third part of the talk was on revolutionary management approaches. Um, now, I'd like to, uh, as I mentioned, my father did not have any formal training in being a manager, and yet he had to manage a lab that employed over uh, 2,000 people, you know, or 3,000 at that time. Huh? 2,000 people. So, so during the course of his career, he developed some very innovative management techniques that he passed on to me, and I have used it in all, successfully in my own career as a manager. But uh, I thought maybe this would be interesting for you. The most famous of these stories was what we call the bicycle shed story. Uh, and in, I'm an engineer uh, by training in electrical engineer. We, uh, electrical engineering, we learned that maximum power transfer occurs when impedances are matched between circuits. And interestingly enough, bureau bureaucracies work in the same way. And the idea is never give a decision maker in a bureaucracy more authority than he deserves. So the story is the following. So when DMR was first constructed, he noticed that everybody was commuting, I mean most of the employees were commuting by bicycles. And there wasn't a shed to protect the bicycles because they would be in the sun and the rain and so on. So my father felt that we needed to do something to at least make the commute comfortable for the employees. So he applied to Delhi for a grant for a very small amount. He said, uh, hey, but in those days, I guess it was a little bit, uh, 2,500 rupees. So for 2,500 rupees, he wanted to construct a bicycle shed. So he went to Delhi to some low-level bureaucrat who wanted to show off his power. And he said, Saab, ye both jala hai, uh, 2,500, we cannot approve it. Uh, as a maximum, I can give you is only 2,000 rupees. Right? So my father got so angry with this, this whole thing that he turned around and proposed a one crore proposal for a new laboratory, uh, office spaces, a cafeteria, and a bicycle shop. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> this proposal went to a minister level. And so at that level, the concern was more about how many new jobs are going to be created, and so on and so forth. And uh, the project was approved, and he got his bicycle shop. <laughs> So, um, and so nowadays in the internet, we we, uh, we we have no we don't even think about when our email gets delivered to the right email address. 
But they had a huge problem in the 60s and so on because files would, would accumulate and nobody knew where the file had to be sent. I mean, the British started this, this bureaucracy thing and we Indians managed to uh, perfect it. Um, so in this particular case, uh, he wanted to get some titanium alloys transferred from uh, uh, one from Kanpur to DMR. And so he didn't, this was controlled by the IAF Engineering Directorate, and he didn't know which department to send the file to. So, and this had stumped other people, and that file sat there for months, right, without going anywhere. So my father's solution was very uh, straightforward. He said, just pick a uh, department at random in Delhi. You know, just send, it, send the file to them, and let's watch what happens. And sure enough, it went to Delhi, and uh, it came back with a very angry note saying that this was the wrong department to send the file to. You should have sent it to this department. And that's how we found out. <laughs> this, that's how we found out the, the actual uh, department to send the file. Um, also, uh, dealing dealing with uh, uh, bureaucracies. I mean, sometimes I mean many of you probably experience this. You send people out to get a signature or get get some forms and so on, and you'll come. People come back saying the officer was not available, gone on vacation, told me to come back later, all kinds of excuses. So my father invented a do or die thing, which is do not return to DMRL until you have accomplished your mission. And so that employee would find some way to get the, get that signature or to get the form and, and so on. So it became a very effective effective solution. Today the employee may not come back. <laughs> <laughs> that danger did not exist yeah. in the 60s. <laughs> 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 well, it's a different world. <laughs> and then uh, on the breakbacks, um, one aspect of the, of it, the management aspect of it was the technology transfer. Uh, so the technology transfer usually, and I have found this in the US also, which is from an R&D facility to a manufacturing organization, technology transfer is very inefficient because people always have an inherent resistance to somebody telling them that, hey, I have this wonderful process, can you make this a manufacturing process? And in the US it is called NIH, meaning not invented here. So, um, but in this, in this case with the brake pads, there was a lot of luck and initiative because uh, what happened was HAL had hired, uh, had anticipated the the brake pad manufacturer. told them to recruit the staff. Recruit, yeah. So they, they recruited the staff several months before the project started. So suddenly you had a lot of uh, engineers and scientists uh, kind of wondering what to do because they had all been hired and my father said to send them to DMR. Okay, so as he... Uh, kind of put it uh, mildly, he said he had a bunch of Naya Bhagras to, to work on. And, and uh, these guys turned out to work out very hard workers. They worked night and day to develop the brake pad process. So by the time they were done doing it, by the time the brake pad process was successful, they knew the ins and outs of the whole process. So that transfer was very smooth. Um, and they could, they knew exactly what equipment they needed, the process uh, terms, and so. In in many ways, this was one of the uh, a very good success story in terms of a very smooth technology transfer. Um, this is all. Uh, this is minor stuff, but very important because he was also in charge of conducting DMR or labor union meetings. And usually, one of the problems in, in agendas is that you have this item called any other <coughs> items. And it's an open discussion topic, and it can take hours. I mean, basically, waste the time of everybody uh, in the in the who's attending the meeting. So he completely eliminated that. And so he said, uh, instead of having you you guys can come back and talk to me later. Let's have some tea, and that was a huge incentive for them to finish the meeting quickly. It's still just there, but it's with the chairman's permission. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, the last part is very much beneficial to me. The problems are still same, but so any solution might be left. <laughs> um, and also, you know, when you have a very large organization. There is inevitable that there will be finger pointing and infighting. So the forging department will, will tell, say that the rolling wood guys was a problem and so on. So uh, the solution was to 
ignore the complaints made by each side and simply tell them to work with each other because each department knew its own limitations. So basically he trusted the professional uh, expertise or experience of these people and put the burden on them to figure out how to work together rather than simply blaming each other. Um, this is something that he did was crazy, which was there would be occasional individual employee fights. And what will happen is all the rest of the staff would just watch these guys fighting and nobody would, would try to do anything. And my father would get into the middle of uh, the, the fight, isolate the combatants, and dis, uh, dismiss all the bystanders, tell them all to get out. And the trick was to make these guys come back to his office the next day, because right after the fight, they're all very angry, so it's impossible to to reason with them, right? And so he would not argue with them on the day of the fight, but he would tell these two to come back the next day and then make them wait, make them wait for a few hours till they were very nervous because now they were thinking about their jobs and what would happen and so on. And when then, then when they came, they were very uh, apologetic and humble and almost crying, crying. almost crying. And then, <laughs> then he would say, Okay, now shake hands and don't do this ever again. <laughs> and no action will be taken against you. So, so uh, the employees, in in a, a sense, uh, liked him a lot because of the very fair way of doing. It. Okay, so uh, the last one here is uh, the issue of old versus young. So it is it is natural that when you have uh, an organization <coughs> such as DML where people have their careers over decades that you will grow old in your job, and as you get older, you get more cynical and uh, set in your ways. And this can be a barrier or a, a hurdle, especially when you hire young people who come in with full of energy, uh, and they want to change the world, and you have all these old people telling them that this cannot be done, and so on and so forth. So the, the issue was how to harness the experience and wisdom of the older st scientists and staff while at the same time keeping the energy and innovation of the younger scientists and their staff, right? So my father's solution was to send the old people on external and international projects. At that time, DMR was, uh, was very instrumental in setting up R&D labs in Iraq. Uh, there was also a project coming up in Indonesia before he retired. Um, so, so the idea was that there they can feel useful and share their, their, their wealth uh, of, uh, of expertise and uh, wisdom, whereas the young scientists are then given some freedom to make, to experiment and make mistakes because the only way they are going to learn is through failures that they, that they make uh, when, they, when they experiment. So um, finally, concluding remarks, right? uh, just a quick one. So there is a phrase in the US, it came, came about uh, essentially for the African American community, it said that mind is a terrible thing to waste. Right? I think it is true in this case, and I talked to you a little bit about the fact that uh, large organizations feel that institutional wisdom is lost when senior people retire, and if there is no continuity where the younger people do not have the benefit of all the wisdom and experience that the older generation had. So there has to be a mechanism created where that continuity is not lost and it truly benefits the, the younger generation so the younger generation can try new things and build on the foundation of what has been achieved before. Um, I, you know, again, this is my biased view. Um, I truly believe that my father is a national treasure for India and if given the opportunity, he has a lot more to contribute before he exits this planet, right? So. So, uh, so, this, uh, so, in fact, even when he was at DMR, he had a revolutionary idea of creating a volunteer organization staffed by DMR retirees who would not be paid, but uh, would work with uh, work would be provided with the laboratories and support staff to be able to continue experimenting with new ideas that may have either immediate or long-term benefits. Today, there's an official mechanism for that. Oh, wonderful! That is called IDSD, no? Oh, excellent. That's great. So that's what he was he was trying to propose. Yes. <coughs> so, so therefore, I would highly encourage you to take your pilgrimage to Chikatpali. It's uh, you know hardly no, no, no. few kilometers away. Two. 
And, and the, the only warnings I give you is that my father will come up with an unconventional solution. You may come with some idea and you may have some ideas of how to solve the problem, but my father will come up with a completely different idea. I can guarantee you that almost. But even if my father's ideas turn, to, turn out to be completely stupid and unworkable, at least, at the very least, they will force you to think in a different way. You know? So that, that at least is useful. And uh, like, uh, like he just did now, my father likes to hide behind his old age. And uh, this is mainly a uh, uh, trick to get your sympathy. He says that his uh, brain has turned to clay. So do not be fooled by this comment. This is essentially a subtle and shameless ploy to gain your sympathy. <laughs> Behind this smoke screen, smoke screen is a mind that is as sharp as ever. So please take advantage of it as long as it seems alive. Thank you. <laughs>